Hi guys, it's Ms. Sheehan, and today we're going to do a lecture on a couple of different aspects of World War I. Um, I'm going to briefly go over some of the new technology that was used in the war, and then we're going to talk about two of the major battles of the war, the battles at Verdun and the Somme. Uh, so I'd like you to go ahead and take notes on this, and let's get into it. Okay. So we'll start off, I know in your reading yesterday, there was a little bit about some of the new technology, but I just wanted to highlight some of the very important pieces um, that come into play in over and over again in wars throughout the rest of the 1900s and even into the 20th century. So um, there were lots of new weapons used in World War I, but the major ones that we're gonna spend a little bit of time talking about were these. Machine guns, chemical weapons, particularly poison gas, tanks and airplanes. There were also things like flamethrowers and bayonets and grenades and mortars and submarines used, but we don't have a ton of time, so we're just going to focus on these four big ones. Okay, so machine guns, more than any other weapon, probably personify World War I. They were the main weapon used by most of the troops on the ground, um, and they really caused most of the devastation of the war. Uh, so most armies used a version of one of the very first machine guns invented by a guy named Hiram Maxim, um, invented it in 1884, and he called it the Maxim machine gun. And those machine guns could shoot anywhere from 400 to 800 bullets per minute, which is a huge number. Um, especially if you compare it to like a rifle where you have to pull the trigger for one shot, right? You could just hold down the trigger and just essentially spray bullets across the field. And in fact, these guns work so well that a version of this machine gun is still used today by militaries around the world, including the U.S. military, um, the 50 caliber machine gun. Very, very similar to what was used in World War I. The technology has not changed that much. Uh, machine guns were primarily used to defend trenches, as you can see here in this picture, right? Uh, you can see the machine guns lined up along the trench, and then a lot of the battles of the war consisted of soldiers coming from the other trenches and literally just running into machine gun fire to try and take the enemy trench. And that was part of the reason that World War I was so deadly, is that it was this combination of offensive tactics, like we talked about, running into machine gun fire versus defensive weapons, which machine guns are defensive. They're really good for guarding one position, right? Um, yeah, so that is machine guns. Uh, the second uh, technology we'll talk about is chemical weapons, poison gas, which were invented during the war. The German army began to develop poison gas weapons, particularly to attack trenches, right? They felt like if they could just throw a gas in and hurt or injure or kill all the people in that trench, then later their soldiers could go in and clear it out, right? Um, so as a way to try to prevent casualties on your side. Chlorine gas was the first chemical weapon used by the Germans against the French on the Western Front in 1915. So it was used fairly early on in the war. Um, eventually, all sides would come to use poison gas weapons, including a variety of ones, chlorine gas, a gas called phosgene, and then mustard gas. Um, but these weapons actually weren't that effective because um, side by side with the development of the gases, the different sides were developing gas masks, right, to protect you from the gas. Um, so they weren't actually as effective in clearing out trenches as the Germans or the British or French really wanted them to be. The really big downside is that poison gas had horrible, horrible, like awful effects, um, including like destroying your lungs from the inside out, so you literally drown in your own blood. Um, blindness was very common, choking, um, internal blisters, that kind of thing. It's a really horrible way to be injured and definitely a horrible way to die. This picture down here is very famous of um, soldiers blinded with phosgene gas uh, guiding each other uh, into a building. Um, and so uh, one, of, uh, one of the things that happened from World War I is that the use of chemical weapons uh, was banned, right? And now it's um, a war crime if uh, countries use chemical weapons, just primarily because of the horrible effects of them. 
Okay, the third technology was tanks. Tanks like poison gas were also uh, developed during the war, um, but this time they were developed by the British, and they basically wanted to build a vehicle that could maneuver over trenches and bombed out land, right? Um, so instead of wheels, tanks have what are called tracks, you can see on here, that just go around and around, so they're able to maneuver over land that a typical wheeled car wouldn't be able to get over. And you can also mount really big guns on them, um, so they're really good for like shooting at positions and stuff like that. Uh, they were first used by the British in late 1916. This here is a British tank. It's called a Mark I, so it's fairly big. And they were used to attack trenches, but they actually weren't that effective at this point, um, primarily because they would get stuck in like the mud and in the barbed wire and stuff like that. However, the British and the French did manage to use them very effectively effectively, particularly at one battle in 1917 called the Battle of Cambrai, where they took almost 12 miles of the German front. So they, eventually they did actually make a really big difference. And this here is a uh, French tank called a Renault, right? The French tanks were a little bit smaller. The British, French, and Germans all used tanks, um, although Germans never really produced more than about 20 tanks total. And the last technology we'll look at is airplanes. Um, airplanes had only been invented in 1903, so just about 10 years before the war started, and they were really new um, and kind of fragile technology, right? You can see these are some World War I planes. They were what's called biplanes, and they could really only carry one or two people in each plane. So during the war, they were primarily used for observation, like right, people would fly over the uh, battlefields and take pictures. Um, they were used for bombing, they could carry certain amounts of bombs, and then also to fire at soldiers both on the ground and uh, in ships, although they were used less for that. Um, airplanes in World War I did not have a huge effect, um, but they're important in this war because they really set the stage for the overwhelming effect and usage that they have in later wars, especially like World War II, where they were used to huge advantage um, by the Germans and then by the US as well. Um, so the technology is really progressed by World War I and then used in later wars. Okay. So now that we've talked a little bit about technology, we're going to talk about two of the major battles of the war. And there were hundreds of battles during World War I, um, and obviously we don't have the time to talk about them, but it is important that you look at a couple of them. So we're going to talk about two battles on the Western Front called the Somme and Verdun. So as you can kind of see here, now this isn't the greatest map, this red line here is the Western Front. So it goes all the way from the British Channel, the ocean here, down to Switzerland, right? And that's where mainly the British and French were fighting against the Germans. And then we have the Eastern Front here, which goes from up here in what used to be Russia, all the way down to the Black Sea here. Um, the Eastern Front we don't talk about as much, primarily because there weren't um, like the trench warfare that we think about when we think about World War I there, and then also the Russians pulled out of the war in 1917, which we'll learn about next year. Anyway, we're going to talk about the Western Front, so we'll talk about the Battle of the Somme, which was right here, and then the Battle at Verdun, which was right there. Okay, so we'll start with Verdun. Verdun was one of the biggest battles of World War I, and it was fought for about 10 months from February 1916 to December 1916. Uh, and it was primarily between the French and the Germans. And it was one of the deadliest battles of the war. More people died at Verdun than almost anywhere else in a single battle. Um, and at the time, it was the longest battle history had ever known. Ten months is an extraordinarily long time to fight over one fairly small piece of land. Um, and yeah, it went on for a really long time. Okay, so Verdun was started by the Germans, um, and basically it was the German idea that they were going to strike a blow into France um, and then be able to use that momentum to move into and capture France, right? So Verdun um, is actually like a little hill and then there's a church there. Uh, so it had important symbolic value to the French in that you wouldn't want the enemy to take over a historical church. 
Um, and then also the Germans thought that the French would bleed out their army trying to defend it, that they would expend lots and lots of resources of both men and money and weapons to try and stop the Germans from taking their gut. And that's what's called a war of attrition, which is really what World War I turned into, each side trying to make the other lose as many resources as possible. So really for the Germans, this was like one of their main ways that they thought they would destroy the French army. Um, the outcome of it, um, it kind of ended in a stalemate. Eventually the Germans who were stretched thin by attacks from the Russians on the Eastern Front and then attacks from the British also on the Western Front withdrew from, from Verdun. So that meant that neither side really got anything out of it, right? The Germans didn't break through the lines, they didn't capture Verdun, and France didn't advance anywhere um, and they still had Verdun, which they had already had. So there was no real tactical or strategic advantage gained by either the French or the Germans. And that's kind of symbolic of World War I as a whole. You're fighting these horrible, bloody, deadly battles over really not that much territory, and no one really got anything out of it. We'll talk about that when we talk about the end of the war. Um, but really the major effect of Verdun and why it's so important in the war was the huge loss of lives, resources, and money by both sides. Um, and it really wounded both the German and the French armies, um, just in terms of number of soldiers lost, the amount of money that was poured into it, and the amount of weapons that were used there. So uh, Verdun resulted in over 300,000 battlefield deaths. Uh, for comparison, um, in World War II, uh, America's total battlefield deaths for four years of war was 400,000. So almost as many in this one single battle than for an entire country in World War II. Um, and that was split about half and half between the French and Germans. And again, uh, on top of that, on top of the death, over 300,000 French and 300,000 Germans were wounded by this battle. So really 900,000 people, almost a million people were affected by this battle, this one battle of the war. And it really came to signify the brutal and bloody and horrible nature of World War I. And it was the longest battle of the war at 10 months. Okay, the second battle was actually happening at the same time as the Battle of Verdun, and this is called the Battle of the Somme. And again, it was on the Western Front. However, unlike the Verdun, where it was a German attack on the French, this was a British and French attack on the German. It was the major Allied attack on Germany on the Western Front. And it lasted from July 1st, 1916 to November 18th, 1916. So shorter than Verdun, but overlapping with it. These battles were happening at the same time. And along with Verdun, it was one of the biggest and bloodiest and longest battles of the war. Uh, so it began actually before July 1st with eight days of bombing the German lines before the British attacked. And this was a major strategic defeat for the British because basically they thought we'll bomb them and we'll destroy their lines and then our soldiers can just walk through and we'll punch through into Germany, right? And that actually had the opposite effect on them. Really what the bombing did was just alert the Germans that something was going to happen. Um, so on July 1st, 1916, Britain assumed that their bombing had destroyed the German trenches and sent thousands and thousands of soldiers to basically take what they thought were going to be these empty trenches, and they weren't. And over 20,000 British soldiers died on the first day of the Somme. July 1st, 20,000 people died that day, um, which is an unbelievably enormous number of people right, to die on one day of the battle. And it really, although every day wasn't as bloody, that was really kind of the signal of what the Somme was going to be, this horrible, bloody, awful battle um, where thousands and thousands of British and French and German soldiers died, um, again, like Verdun, over really nothing. Um, so as I said, this was an attempt by the Germans to push through the German lines, but after months of fighting from July to November of 1916, it resulted in really only very small gains for um, Britain. 
and France. But the big effect for them on the positive side was that it greatly weakened the German war effort. Not only were the Germans fighting against the British and the French in Verdun, but they were also fighting, or in the Somme, they were also fighting against the French in Verdun, and they were fighting against the Russians on the Eastern Front. So they were basically fighting three huge battles on in three different spots, and this was extremely, it weakened their army extremely. Uh, this, along with Verdun, was one of the costliest battles of the war. There were over a million casualties, that means dead or wounded, um, over 500,000 for the German side alone, and more than 300,000 total deaths for the battle. So Verdun and the sum alone caused 600,000 battlefield deaths, which is a huge, unbelievably huge number. Right, um, And that's why we really remember these two battles is because they were so deadly and so brutal and really neither of them resulted in any real gains or winning for either side. So the land around the Western Front, especially at the Somme and Verdun, is still marked with craters and old weapons today. I went there last summer. Um, to visit some of these battlefields, and you can still see some of the trenches from literally a hundred years ago, right? This uh, was called, uh, this is called the Longival Crater. It's a huge crater that was caused by a British mine, like huge, like hundreds of feet deep. And then you can see these are literal remnants of trenches, right? And these are old shells from artillery from big guns that are still there. They're just sitting there, right? And Belgium and Northern France is all marked with all these different craters and lines of trenches and um, rusting weapons that have just been there for a hundred years. That's how costly and deadly these battles were is that the landscape is still marked by them even a century later, right? A couple more pictures. This is what, uh, this is a rebuilt trench. Um, at a British war memorial, right? So these war trenches, and then they rebuilt them and you can kind of walk through them and kind of get a feel of what the trenches were like, right? And this is um, an underground trench, communication trench um, that you can walk through underneath these trenches here. So that's kind of, um, and you can really experience what it was like to be a soldier. So if you ever go to France, it's very cool to go and look at all these trenches, but it also really gives you a sense of how devastating the war was. Okay, um, we will stop there for today. Um, I hope you guys are doing well, staying safe and healthy. Um, as always, you can ask me questions in Teams or via email. Bye.